When taking measurements in the solar system, we typically use two primary sets of reference frames. We use either equatorial reference frames or ecliptic reference frames. And these are most easily understood via their historical definitions, although currently they have slightly different definitions based on very, very precise definition of an inertial frame based on measurements of extragalactic radio sources. But intuitively, the equatorial plane makes sense because it is just an extension to infinity of the Earth's equatorial plane. So the plane passing through the equator of the Earth that is orthogonal to the North and South Poles is the equatorial plane. The ecliptic plane is the plane of the Earth's orbit. And it is rotated from the equatorial plane by this argument epsilon, known as the obliquity of the ecliptic, which has a value of approximately 23.44 degrees. Now, this is given as an approximate value for two reasons. First of all, the actual value has many more decimal places, but more importantly, in reality, none of these quantities is fixed in time. The Earth's North Pole direction wanders by a very, very small, but very measurable amount. And over the course of tens of thousands of years, this wandering of the North Pole is actually sufficiently large that the pole star changes. Currently, Polaris, the pole star, is what we use when we're doing very rudimentary navigation as the North Pole direction. However, 30,000 years ago, when our ancestors were navigating at the tail end of the last ice age, they might have used Vega, which was much closer to the North Pole direction. And tens of thousands of years from now, Vega will once again be much closer to the North Pole direction than the pole star. Similarly, the Earth's orbit is not an ideal two-body orbit. It doesn't always have a single plane that is fixed for all time. It's affected by the other masses of the solar system and other forces. And so when we say the ecliptic plane is the plane of the Earth's orbit, that is insufficiently precise for modern measurements. So the modern definitions of these things are made so that they match as closely as possible the historical definitions, but they are much, much more precise than these original statements. This is just another view of essentially the same thing, and also pointing out that we frequently use different coordinate origins for these reference frames. To try to keep things clear, whenever it's relevant, we will differentiate between equatorial and ecliptic reference frames by denoting the equatorial frames as primed in their frame definitions and the ecliptic frames as unprimed. So you can see this more clearly on the Earth version. The red unprimed G frame is the ecliptic reference frame. And in this case, it has a coordinate origin of the Earth's center. And then the primed G prime blue unit directions that represents an equatorial frame. And you can see E2 prime passing through the equator. The E1 direction is a special direction because this is the inertially fixed reference direction. Historically, this was denoted by this symbol, which is the astrological symbol for the ram or Aries, because this is the vernal equinox direction. E1 is the direction where the equatorial plane crosses with the ecliptic plane. So this means that this is the direction of the sun as seen from the earth at the vernal or spring equinox. In modern usage, that is not a sufficiently detailed definition. And so this direction is now once again, just like everything else, determined by the re inertial reference frame developed from measurements of extragalactic sources. But we still retain some of this old nomenclature because it's slightly more intuitive. So all of these I, I prime, G, and G prime are used in different contexts as inertial frames. G and G prime are anchored to the center of the Earth but they are not rotating with the Earth. And so they are useful as inertial frames for Earth orbiting spacecraft. Once you get away from the Earth, then you have to go to a heliocentric reference frame or a barycentric reference frame, which has the same basic unit vector definitions, but is anchored to the center of mass of the whole solar system. There's a final fifth frame on here, which I have called G sub B, and this is explicitly a non-inertial frame. This is a frame anchored to the center of mass of the Earth that rotates with the Earth. And its first unit direction, G1, goes through the prime meridian, which historically was defined as the Greenwich meridian running through the Greenwich Observatory in Britain. And again, just like everything else, now has 
a more modern, much, much more precise definition, but is still basically aligned with that original prime meridian definition. Much of the time in astrodynamics, we describe things using spherical coordinates. Spherical coordinates are incredibly useful when your angle measurements of where an object is are much, much more precise than the separation measurement. And this is typically true both for spacecraft tracking and for tracking natural bodies. It is much easier to track the movement in the plane of the sky of something than it is to measure the distance to it. And so we use spherical coordinate systems a lot because these map directly into unit directions. And then we leave the measurement of separation as a separate quantity to be brought in as necessary. And so here are some of the most commonly used coordinate systems. And in all of these cases, please note that these are elevation angles. So these are complements to a polar zenith angle, and that's just the convention for all of these. So when measuring things on the Earth, we can use a geographic coordinate system. Its origin is the center of mass of the Earth. Its reference plane is the equator. Its prime direction is the prime meridian. And the angles, the azimuth angle is called the longitude, and the elevation angle is called the latitude. Frequently in literature, this will be noted by phi. We've previously defined phi as strictly a polar angle, so we will typically be calling this capital L. You can also do a frame that is anchored to the surface of the Earth at the location of the observer, and it takes the reference plane of the horizon, a prime direction of north, and its angles are called the azimuth and the elevation. And we'll be coming back to this one because it's incredibly important for Earth-based measurements. Then we have our equatorial and ecliptic frames and coordinate systems, and these can be either geocentric or heliocentric or bariocentric, and the only difference between them is their reference plane, and their prime direction is that vernal equinox direction. For an equatorial set of coordinates, the angle names will always be right ascension and declination. So if you are given right ascension and declination values, you instantly know that you are working in an equatorial system. For the ecliptic system, these will be just be called the ecliptic longitude and the ecliptic latitude. Finally, Astronomers frequently use galactic coordinates whose origin is heliocentric and whose reference plane is the galactic plane, the plane of the Milky Way galaxy with a prime direction of the direction of the galactic center. And again, their coordinates are just known as the galactic longitude and the galactic latitude. I've already mentioned a few times that the modern implementation of all of this is based on ultra precise measurements of extra galactic sources. The name of all of this is the International Celestial Reference System, or ICRS. ICRS is called a system because it is a methodology for developing the actual reference frame. And then the implementations of the system are called ICRF, the International Celestial Reference Frames. And currently we are on ICRF3, which was adopted on January 1st, 2019. So this is very much an ongoing process of defining and redefining and further refining all of these definitions. This is based on 40 years of data from very long baseline interferometric measurements of extragalactic radio sources. Originally using 2.3 and 8.4 gigahertz bands, for the last 15 years, 24 and a mixture of 8.4 and 32 gigahertz bands. And these measurements track 4,356 extragalactic sources. And of these, 303 are selected as being the best quality data and therefore are the defining sources for this reference frame. And because these objects are so monstrously distant from us, they are effectively the fixed stars that Newton spoke of in his Principia. Of course, even they have some motion, have some acceleration of this, but on the time scales that we are most interested in, that really does not become apparent in the data. And so these are incredibly precise definitions of an overall stationary reference frame. So ICRF3 helps us define the true vernal equinox direction, the mean equatorial plane, the mean ecliptic plane, and everything else that we have just spoken about. When you get coordinates now, you will typically get them as ICRF coordinates or some conversion from ICRF. Let's return now to the topocentric horizon coordinate system. Even though the focus here is on space and objects in space, the vast majority of measurements of anything are still done from the surface of the Earth. Because of this, there's the additional complexity that the origin of your measurement point is moving in time because it is rotating along with the Earth. 
And so we need to be very careful in treating this. And what we do is we define a specialized reference frame and a specialized set of spherical coordinates associated with this frame. The frame is known as the topocentric horizon frame, or sometimes the vocal observer frame. And it's defined via the coordinate directions S, E, U. S for south, E for east, U for up. S and E lie along the local horizon plane of the observer, with the north direction just being defined as negative of south. We define this as south to make this a true right-handed frame. The azimuth, slightly confusingly, is measured in the SE plane, but from north. So a zero azimuth is something pointing north or negative south. The elevation then is measured up from the SE plane to whatever radius you're measuring. The conversion between the SEU frame and the G prime frame, which you will recall in our nomenclature is an earth-centered inertial frame, and the prime means that it is equatorial, is given by another set of two spherical angles. One of these, the latitude, encodes the constant latitude of the observer's site. And the second one, this theta LST value, tells us the location currently of the meridian of the observer. So recall, E1 prime is an inertially fixed direction. It is that vernal equinox direction. And so this theta LST is a time varying angle that tells us the azimuth between E prime one and the meridian of the observer. So we will need a method of calculating this value and we will provide one for ourselves shortly. When discussing the topocentric horizon coordinate system, we effectively modeled the earth as a sphere. But of course the earth is not spherical. The Earth, in fact, is best described as a bumpy oblate spheroid. And we will come back to that description when we talk about orbital perturbations. But for now, let's forget the bumpy part and just focus on the fact that the Earth is an oblate spheroid. The Earth is elongated along its equator because of its rotation, which causes a redistribution of its mass. And so if we want to get to a higher level of specificity than just our spherical model, we can fit an ellipsoid to the average shape of the Earth. And this is sometimes called the reference geoid. And in particular, we will be using the World Geodidic System, WGS84 reference ellipsoid, because this is the one that's the basis for the GPS constellation and GPS measurements. This system defines a rotation rate of the Earth, given here as omega e, and this is a definitional quantity. It defines the semimeter axis of this reference ellipsoid, a sub e, and again, this is a definitional quantity. And then it defines the flattening. And the flattening is, of an ellipse is defined as the semi-major axis minus the semi-minor axis divided by the semi-major axis. So from this, we can calculate the effect of eccentricity of this ellipsoid, which can give us the semi-minor axis. And this is a calculated value, hence the approximate. Just as there is an ICRS, there's also an IERS, International Earth Rotation System. And the current realization of this places the zero point, the prime meridian, very, very near the original Greenwich meridian, about 5.3 arc seconds away, or 102.5 meters away. So the way that we should be thinking about the location of a point on the Earth's surface is as having some height above or below this reference ellipsoid. And this height is a local vertical which means that the angle that this line, this height line makes with the semi-major axis of the reference ellipsoid, the thing that we call latitude, is actually not measured from the center of the Earth. The center of the Earth measurement angle is the geocentric latitude, which we prime, and the latitude that we typically talk about and use is the geodidic latitude, which we will leave as the L unprimed. So our coordinates are, an azimuth direction, the longitude, lambda, a geodidic latitude, L, and some h, that is a height above or below this reference ellipsoid. And so we can convert between all these measurements and the vectors that we need in order to determine the location of the origin of our topocentric horizon frame with respect to the center of mass of the Earth via this set of equations. You'll notice that we still have this theta LST term here, which we've previously stated as a time varying quantity. And so we still need to know how to measure this value. But before we can get into that, we have to talk about measurements of time.